Uh, Windows Kernel Graphics Driver Attack Surface by Ilya Van Sprudel. Van Sprudel. Okay, looks like, that. looks like that works. Awesome. So yes, I will be talking about Windows Kernel Graphics Driver Attack Surface. Uh, as just mentioned, my name is Ilya Van Sprudel. I am the Director of Penetration Testing uh, at IOActive. Um, I do penetration testing, code reviews, lead teams, basically break stuff for fun and profit and sometimes advise on how to fix things. Um, right, so let's dive in. What's this, what's, uh, my agenda basically, so I'll start, I'll, I'll do a slide about what this thing is about and then we sort of gives the uh, 50,000 feet view of uh, what these drivers are like. Um, and then I sort of dive into the entry points where I say, well, there's entry points and these are the conditions under which these entry points um, can be entered into. Um, and then once, uh, once that's covered, and so how do you get there from, how do you get to the kernel stuff from user land? And once I cover all that stuff, um, I sort of, I'll do a demo of a, of a tool that, that shows how this thing works. Um, and then the last part, sort of putting it all together, is where the, the fun begins, where um, I'll talk about how to fuzz these things, how to first engineer them, um, and I'll do a small demo of how to fuzz a driver. Um, so what is this talk about? Well, it's, as it's helping said, about uh, Windows graphics drivers, specifically uh, WDDM graphics drivers. That's the Windows Display Driver Model, uh, which is a, a, a new driver model. Um, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, <clears throat> as for the audience, um, or the target audience, uh, I guess people that want to audit graphics drivers, the perfect uh, target audience, but also developers. I mean, if you're a developer, it, it, it's nice to know what the attack surface is. There's a fair amount of developer documentation and it tells you how to write a driver, but it's, it's, it's not written for hackers, so it doesn't tell you this is a tax surface, this isn't. Um, so I'd like to believe that my presentation gives you better coverage on that. So if you're uh, writing graphics drivers, I'd like to believe that this is also uh, um, useful to you. And, uh, and the other target audience is just generally curious people, right? If you want to know about the Windows kernel or something like that, then there is hopefully some interesting stuff in this presentation. Um, as for knowledge needed to follow this presentation, uh, some basic knowledge of Windows kernel stuff is, is useful. Um, uh, since it's not that much like other Windows drivers, it's not necessary, but it's useful to understand some concepts. Um, right, so Windows graphics drivers. There's two models. There's the old model before Windows Vista and the new model, uh, WDDM uh, after, or the Vista and, and onwards. Um, the old model is called XPDDM or XDDM. It's Windows 2000, Windows XP. It's legacy, uh, it is no longer supported as of Windows 8, um, and it's not stuff I'll cover in this presentation. It's, it looks completely different, and so I'm not covering it. Um, I will be covering uh, the attack surface for WDDM drivers, or you know, Windows Display uh, Driver Model, um, and so the first version of that came out with Vista, and then with Win 7, a, a, a more evolved version came out in Windows 8. They added a bunch of new features, and 8.1, a, a, a number of other features got added, like uh, Miracast and those kind of things. Um, I won't obviously describe the entire model because we'll be here a week from now, um, but I, I will describe the parts that are interesting from a security perspective alone. Um, if there's anything like driver-wise that you have questions about or, or not quite sure about, the documentation is actually pretty good. It just doesn't focus on the security part. Um, so before we dive into specifics, who actually makes these things? Because it turns out there's a, a, a pretty large number of, of graphics drivers. Uh, obviously the individual, individual hardware vendors Right, In, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, Qualcomm, FIA, Matrox, and so forth, they make drivers. And th those are the ones that ex usually expose a lot of tax surface because they're very rich, right? Because they expose all the magic of these cards, right? And as we know, graphics cards nowadays are very, very advanced pieces uh, of hardware. And so the drivers for those are generally uh, very rich. Uh, it, they'll, they'll, the images for these things will generally be several megabytes large. Um, and while that might not mean much, for a graphics driver to be 10 megabytes, is, or for any Windows driver to be 10 megabytes is enormous. It means there's a lot in there. Um, so that obviously those are the, 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 the drivers um, that we know. Uh, there's others. Obviously there's the basic fallback. This is sort of the bare minimum display driver. This comes from Microsoft. This comes in box with Windows. If you have no graphics drivers, you fall back to this. Um, there isn't much there. I've looked. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about those. It does the bare minimum. Um, and you see that because you know, your graphics kind of suck when you end up with those drivers. Um, and then there you have sort of the uh, special purpose drivers, right? So, for example, virtualization, um, they, they, each virtualization uh, uh, software comes with its own uh, uh, Windows guest drivers. So VMware has them, VirtualBox has them, Parallels has them, um, and pretty much all of them have them. If, if you have a window, Windows guest, they'll have sort of the, the guest install additions, whatever. 
I mean, they'll come with a graphics driver. And, and uh, they're, they're usually a lot thinner than the, uh, than the individual hardware drivers because they have like one narrow purpose, right? Um, and then there's a few others, right? There's uh, stuff like virtual uh, display. Um, and these, these come from like, smaller, uh, smaller companies. Um, again, these are usually uh, relatively small because they have like one narrow purpose. Um, but they could still, I mean, they would still expose interesting attack surface, right? Okay, um, so yeah, so let's talk about WDM. WDM is um, sort of, it's uh, a split model where as much of the driver as possible runs in user land, and then the, th the bits of the driver that can't run in user land uh, end up in, in kernel. At least that, that's how WDM was designed. And so there's this model where uh, user land talks to kernel, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that interface uh, in, in a lot more depth uh, later on. Um, and so this, this, this move was done for stability and reliability, and I found this really, really awesome quote um, on MSDN about why it was done. It says, um, in Windows XP, display drivers, which are large and complex, can be a major source of system instability. These drivers execute entirely in kernel mode, you know, deep in the system code, and hence, a single problem in driver will often force the entire system to reboot. Basically, you get a blue screen, right, if something goes really wrong. Um, it says, according to crash analysis data collected during the Windows XP timeframe, display drivers are responsible for up to 20% of all blue screens. That is throughout the Windows ecosystem, right? 20%, that, that's, uh, and that's with the old model, XPDDM, right? Because everything ran in kernel, and so one single mistake anywhere, you get a crash. Um, and so WDM set out to change that and said, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna Take as much as we can, move it into user land, and then if you get a crash there, then that, the, the, the process just crashes and you could restart and, and it starts over, but you don't take the system with you. And only the, the parts that have to run in kernel, the things you can't do from user land, the, the privileged stuff, only that uh, will run in kernel. Um, it's not to say that the, the user land drivers don't have interesting attack surface. I mean, they do, right? They, there's encoders and decoders in there. Um, they can have like binary planting attacks. Uh, some APIs may be indirectly exposed through the web through stuff like WebGL. So the user, the user mode stuff still has interesting attack surface, but it's not what I'll cover in this presentation. I'll, I'll only focus on the kernel mode stuff, where we know where the interfaces are relatively well-defined, and we know we can pick and, and point and say, that's, that's attack surface. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this is a, a rough view, though. But if you take, uh, okay, so if you take any piece of like a program, this, this will be your program, and then it'll go out, and uh, this will be uh, the direct uh, 3D um, stuff, and this will be uh, your OpenGL interfaces, and this will be your OpenGL uh, installable client driver, and so this, this, is the, this, will, this will be, this is the user land uh, graphics driver stuff, right? And they all end up calling, because they have to go to their, they have to go to their uh, kernel driver, they end up going to uh, Winter 2K, and it, it's very, very thin. It's just a, sys, a syscall layer. It, it's five instructions, basically. It goes into user land, goes does syscall, and then, and then you know, once the syscall is done, it returns back. Uh, and then, obviously, um, GDI, uh, um, you know, it, it's relatively thin, but it has to do marshalling and validation and capturing all that stuff. So some things do happen here. Um, uh, some things do happen here, and then it goes through the... Uh, 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 the DXG kernel, which is uh, the DXG kernel part, basically, which is another driver. So uh, both uh, um, winter2k.sys and, um, and DXG kernel or sys are drivers, but they're really essential parts of Windows. Um, but th it, it's part of the graphics subsystem. So it's technically not part of the kernel, or like the core kernel, because it's not NTOS, but Windows won't do anything without these things. Um, so they're, they're pretty much always there. Um, and then the, the DX kernel basically ends up calling into uh, this thing, which is the, the, the graphics driver, which is the attack server, which is what we're going to discuss. Um, but this is sort of a rough overview. There's, there's a lot of layers in between all of this, though, but I think this is more or less captures it. Um, so what does a, a WDM KB driver looks like, like a skeleton. What's the bare minimum you have to do, right? Let's, let somebody writes one and they put it in front of you and say, start auditing. What, 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 do you, what, what does it look like? Well, it'll look like, I mean, it'll, there'll be lots of other stuff in there, but this is, this is you, it won't do anything without this, right? And this basically means um, uh, you, you start off making a driver entry um, uh, uh, function, which is the way uh, any 
win Windows uh, driver starts. Um, technically, it doesn't have to be called win uh, driver entry. Um, you can give it a different name and have to jump through a number of hoops and it'll still work, but they're pretty much all called driver entry because it's convenient. Um, and then uh, what happens is you fill out the structure called driver initialization data, which basically holds a number of callbacks that say, well, if the user's going to do this graphics operation or this graphics operation or this graphics operation or a number of which, then these call, then uh, the, the winter indicates this and the, the DX uh, kernel uh, will go to your driver and say, oh, it's, oh, it's this operation and it's this callback for this driver and it'll, it'll call your callback, right? Um, <clears throat> and then uh, once you have that structure filled out, you call uh, DXGK initialize um, and that, that basically, that uh, function basically goes to the DX kernel and says, hey, here's my set of callbacks. Now you know about them. When somebody does this operation, um, find the right callback and call back into me. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that you, uh, Unlike almost any other uh, driver in Windows, there are no ERPs, there are no IOCTLs. It's nothing like uh, WDDM. Uh, you never pass the IO manager. None of, none of that stuff is uh, uh, none of that none of that stuff is is, is is there for a graphics driver. It has it's, it's complete uh, completely different path. Um, it, yeah, there's a very similar variant of this, which is basically so you can make a, a, a kernel only display driver. Uh, where you have no user land equivalent, um, and, and it's it's a fairly similar uh, callback model, a fairly similar function to call, a fairly similar struct to fill out, uh, but the callbacks are slightly different depending on which operation happens. <clears throat> so this callback, uh, this, this 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 structure, the structure that I, I spoke of, obviously contains a, a, a large number of callbacks. Uh, it's forty or fifty, maybe sixty, very very large number. Um, as a security guy, I'm only interested in the things that expose attack surface, right? What is it that I can call from user land where I can pass like raw bytes that I know it's going to parse, right? That's the stuff you care about, right? And so there's sort of the, you know, there, there are things that, that, that you have very little control over as an attacker, you know, things that'll happen because so and so needs to happen, but it, you don't get to pass it into data, right? So, th so from a, a hacker's point of view, we don't care about those callbacks, right? And then there's some where you have some indirect control over some things and it may or may not be interesting depending on what the driver does and, and how it does these things. And then sort of the, the, the third category is sort of the, where you get to like, be like, hey, here's a blob of data um, and I can pass you two gigabytes of, 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 of bytes and it'll just parse, right? That's the stuff we care about, right? That's the attack surface. <laughs> so that's what we're concerned about and that's what I'll, what I'll, uh, what I'll talk about. Before I dive into um, the entry points of, of the driver stuff, um, there's a few things I want to say about synchronization. Uh, because So WDM has its own uh, synchronization model. Um, and this is interesting to keep in mind. If you go look at these drivers and, and uh, you see something that looks like, uh, like a race condition, you need to know this model because otherwise you'll go like, oh, that's a race condition. And it turns out it's not because of the synchronization model around WDM. So this, this is interesting. It's, there, there's, sort of, there, there's four levels to it and they, they, they call them level three to level zero. So level three is the most restrictive and level zero is pretty much wide open. Uh, so level three is sort of the, well, you can't be doing anything basically, right? Only a single threat may ever enter. The GPU has to be idle. There's no DNA buffeting process. All video memory has to be evicted from CPU. So basically, the, if the card's doing anything, you're, you're sitting there blocking until, the, until, it's, until nothing's happening. Uh, so three is very restrictive. Uh, two is pretty much the same, except uh, video memory doesn't have to be evicted to the host CPU. Uh, one is sort of the, is, is uh, way more liberal in the sense that um, depending on who, who uh, which thread and for which code pad gets called into it, there's these, it gets divided up in these classes. And from each class, only one thread may enter. Um, and then um, zero is basically like completely re entered right? Anybody can call whenever they want. However, and this is interesting to know because e even in this liberal zero level, um, concurrency uh, is allowed, uh, but no, two concurrent threads belong to the same process may enter. And that's interesting when you think about um, uh, 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 race conditions because a lot of cases you'll have these resources that are shared among a process, so different threads will have the same resource, but uh, different threads, uh, different processes won't share them. So you'll have a lot of these things that look like a race condition, even though it may, something may be called under uh, synchronization level zero, it just won't be a race condition because of the way it was designed. Um, Okay, so now that we have um, the entry points, uh, the synchronization stuff out of the way, let's dive into the entry points. <laughs> I went over um, 
uh, I went over a list of them, and, and they're fairly well documented on MSDN. If you want to know, you can go over them and you can read them, and you'll, you'll waste a, a week or so trying to figure out what all of that means, and maybe longer. Um, and I, so I've come down to like a small list of callbacks where I can be like, yeah, that, that's attack surface. Like, that's where the bugs are going to be. Um, and so basically, um, there's sort of four uh, callbacks. One is escape, one's render, one's allocation info, and one's query adapter. Escape is basically the graphics driver um, equivalent of ioctals. Um, even the old model had it too, um, but it was, it was slightly different, but it was the same concept. Um, and, and so basically, the, the escapes work by basically just being like, you know, here's a blob of data, and then, uh, and render obviously goes, you know, once you've done something, you say render, and the, the, it, it'll render. Allocation is basically to get like some DMA buffers and, and, and stuff done. And query adapter is basically where you can go to a graphics card or the driver and say, hey, give me this kind of information, or give me this kind of information, or give me this kind of information. Um, <laughs> so uh, before I dive into these, um, so one of the things I want, I want to get, I want to get uh, or cover is um, not just so what the entry points are, but how do you get there from user land? Because it's all nice and well to sort of have a list of these, sort of, this is your entry point, but how do you actually call into it, right? So before we get into it, um, I want to, like just give like a very small brief look over you know how do you how do you write it initialize a user land piece that gets to a graphics driver right um, and then once I got that um, I'll go into the callbacks and when I go into callbacks I'll be like okay this is this is the the way it work the way I'll do it is I'll say okay this is the the, the kernel interface and this is what it does and how it works and where the attack where the attack surface is and I'll be like and this is the the user land function you call to get there. And, how, and sort of the order between these things. I know it's a little bit dry, um, but it's sort of the, the run up to the fun part, which is where you get to do the fuzzing and reverse engineering. Because if you don't know the first part, you're not gonna get anywhere. If you don't know how the interface works, you can't audit it, you can't fuzz it, right? Um, so please bear with me for, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe? Um, so uh, the driver point installation stuff. Um, I, I'm going to assume that you have done like trivial graphics programming before in Windows user land. And what, what I mean is like, you've, you, you've used GDI, you know what, uh, uh, what a, a, like a, a device context handle is and, and that kind of stuff, right? So we start off with a, a handle to a device context, which is in the GDI world, that's where you start off with. That's your handle to anything you want to do. If you want to print something, you use the HDC. If you want to do something graph, you use the HDC, right? So we assume we come from GDI world, we have an HDC. Um, from the HDC, it's sort of the, it's, there's sort of three steps you have to do to sort of get to the WDM driver stuff where you can really start doing stuff, right? First thing is you, you have to, um, WDM, the callbacks don't, they don't really care about HGCs, they have what they call adapter handles. So you wanna go from HGC to an adapter handle. Once you have an adapter handle, uh, you wanna get a device handle out of it. And once, now there's a number of things you can do once you have a, a device handle, but there's also a number of things you can't do until you create a context for your device. Um, so the step so is basically steps. Right? Once you, if you have an HTC, step one is uh, convert HTC to adapter handle, and then create a device handle out of the adapter handle, and then get a context for that uh, device. And it's basically it's a set of fairly simple uh, um, functions that you call. Um, and so these are, are the functions themselves. There's I haven't been able to find any program that or, or uh, um, sample code that tells you how to do it. Uh, but the functions themselves are documented in MSDN. So you basically uh, fill out the structure um, where you say, hey, here's, here's my HTC, and then you call uh, um, D3D KMT open adapter from HTC, you, pa you pass it the structure, and if it succeeds, it goes and says, okay, here's your adapter. Uh, once you have the adapter handle, you wanna get a device handle out of it, which is a similar process. You fill out the structure, you say, well, here's my uh, adapter handle, and then you call uh, D3D KMT create device, and if that succeeds, uh, you basically get back a, a, a device handle. Okay, All right. So, and then the step three is to create a context for the device. Um, so the, the previously device, uh, obtained, so the device handle you now have is the stuff you pass along to most of your calls to, uh, to the kernel stuff, for, to the kernel driver. Um, and so in order to do anything, you need to create a device context for the device. In most cases, you need a device context. Depending on what you want to do, some things do work without a device context. Um, but uh, when you create a device context, uh, things like uh, setting up command buffers that you pass back and forth between user land and kernel, um, that's what happens when you start create a device context. And these are all things the driver does on your behalf. Like it'll do allocations in user space on your behalf that get passed back and forth. Um, 
There, so uh, when you create um, uh, a, a device context, there's actually, there's always some attack surface here. Um, so when you make this call to kernel, um, you, you get to provide a pointer which says, okay, here's data, and you get to provide a size and says, okay, here's data. Um, and it's not, <clears throat> it's not, so that pointer in length is, is up to the driver to do with it. Any, they, it, it, they can do with it anything they want. The, the documentation doesn't say that it has to be structured anyway. It's just a pointer in the length. Um, most drivers I've seen at this point don't really do much with this, with this data at this point. Um, but it, it's up to the driver. So some drivers may just take that data and just implement an arbitrary protocol and start doing all sorts of parsing. So there is potential attack surface when you create a context. But it's completely driver dependent. Um. <clears throat> so this is basically, um, you know, um, it's the, the same, the similar concept as before where you, know, you fill out a structure and then you say, well, here's my device handle and, you, and then you call uh, create, uh, uh, T3D, um, KMD create context um, and if that succeeds, then you get a context and there's, so, and the, the structure you pass basically is, is this thing and, uh, and the, so these are the interesting ones, right? Um, is uh, private uh, driver data size and, and, pri and uh, private driver data. Um, if, if the driver uh, has a parser for that, that's tax surface. That's stuff you care about, right? If, you ever, if you're gonna write a fuzzer, that, that, those are things you wanna fuzz. Okay, and then... Uh, yeah, so... Um, when you're when you're done, so the, these are sort of the output buffers. Um, so this is when you create a context. A driver does a number of things on your behalf. So it'll create a command buffer and it'll map it into your address space. Um, so you don't get to map it, but you could, you control it and it's in your address space. And this is the the, the buffer that's going to be used when you send commands back and forth between user and kernel. Uh, that's the buffer that's going to be used. And then we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but these are sort of uh, allocations, stuff that happens when you create a context that the driver does on your behalf. Okay, so now that I've sort of covered the sort of, you know, how do I actually get to talk to this thing? Where do you start? Um, there's, I'll, I'll talk about the four entry points that I, that I mentioned by, by, uh, previously, which is escape, render, uh, allocation, and, and query adapter, right? So I'll start off with escape. Um, the callback is called uh, DXGKDDI escape. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is the IOCTL of graphics drivers, right? So if, if you're familiar with um, uh, general uh, Windows drivers, um, obviously IOCTL is, is usually the main thing where, where you go and look for bugs. Um, graphics drivers, it's, the, it's escape. It, it's a similar concept, it's just the arguments are different. Um, this is very much like the old, so if you had the, the old uh, display model, there's a function called xescape, which is, this is pretty much the equivalent of that. Um, however, xescape sort of separates out um, a, a function number and then you get a, a blob of data. Um, and for WDM, that's sort of, there, there's no type anymore. There's just a blob of data. Um, so what that means is there, there's no structures, there's no predefined protocol at all. It's the driver is free to implement it any way it sees fit. Um, yes, yeah, MSDN describes it as, uh, the, that function shares information with user mode and display driver, but it, it's, it's the graphics driver IOCTL equivalent, basically. Um, and this, this falls under uh, threading level two. Um, so race conditions in, 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 in escape callbacks, unlikely. Not, not saying it's impossible, but it's unlikely. Um, so what does this look like? Well, the, the kernel interface kind of looks like this. So if, if, if you're gonna audit a driver, if you have implement one, um, you basically, the, the callback will have this function and it'll look like this, and this is the sort of the predefined pro, uh, how this function looks like. Um, and the, the thing you care about is, the, the second argument is, is a structure that gets passed on. And it'll contain a, a handle device and a couple of flags and a context. And from a DACA point of view, generally those are things you, you don't really care about because you don't control them. But the interesting part is obviously the, the driver data and the driver data size because that says, this is stuff that came from user land. This is attacker control content. That's, that's potential attacks. Anything that touches that has to do extensive validation or, you know, the, or things will go very wrong. Um, so yeah, a few more things about this. I, I started looking into it because I wanted to see what the conditions are around this data. Um, and so uh, this, this uh, private driver data is probed and captured. And if you don't know what probed and captured means is that uh, it, it's sort of, these are kernel concepts that, that 
that are, are, are terms that come from the Windows world for kernel concepts. Probe means that um, they, they uh, before the, hand, the data is handed to you, the Windows kernel has made sure that this piece of data um, is, is uh, that that you pass from user land that it's, it's valid, that it's valid, and that it's in, in user land uh, range, and that it, it, it's mapped, and all this kind of stuff. And captures means that once they've done that, it's been it's been mirrored into um, kernel address space. Um, so what that means is that um, while you you as an attacker control the content, you don't control the memory region itself. You can't unmap it while the driver's trying to do things. All those problems don't occur because it's probed and captured. Um, but beyond that, you as an attacker have full control over the content. Between sending this from, from your user land function to the, the actual driver, there's no validation of the content that happens. So every bit that ends up, um, every bit ends up in, in this interface, uh, in the, the private data, that's a tax or if you control that. Pri uh, prior to this function, it's never been validated. Uh, and there's no length restrictions on this. Um, so what, one of the things is usually when you have this kind of interfaces, one of the things people tend to do is, or, or, when they do this kind of out, like probing caption, they'll be like, well, well, we'll put a link restriction. We'll say, well, you get to use, I don't know, 10 pages or 100 pages or whatnot. Um, in WDM case, um, there is no link restrictions. Um, because the uh, driver data size is a uint, technically there is a link restriction in the sense that it's restricted to four gigabytes. But you know, four gigabytes should, should give you enough attack surface, right? Um, and so uh, the probing capturing is interesting because it means you don't have to do any kind of validation because the, the memory is already there. Of course, if, if the protocol uh, allows, the protocol between user mode and kernel mode allows for any kind of embedded pointers in, in, in that length, then obviously those pointers still need to be validated and probed and captured and so forth. Um, so how do you talk this stuff from user land? Well, it's, it's as before, basically, um, it's a function called D3D KMD escape, um, and it has a structure, and the structure is, 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 is on MSDN, and again, it, it, so the, the structure isn't exactly the same, but there's, you know, they look very similar, right? There's a, an adapter handle and a device handle and a type and flags and a context. Um, and these are things, obviously, as, as, as I said before, that where there isn't that much attack surface, but it, you know, it's, it's the, the, the driver data and the driver data size that are interesting and important, and that's, that's where the bugs are gonna be. Um, and it's really not, like it's a function, but it's, it's really just a system call. There's nothing happens. Uh, so what's funny is that if you look at, if you look at the IDA and you look at the export table, it's called D3D KMD escape. Uh, but then if you go to the Microsoft symbol server, the symbol server comes back and says, that's not D3D KMD escape, that's um, NTGDI DDI, uh, DDDI escape, which means it's a system call, right? It just happens to be one that's exported under a different name. Um, so the, these functions are, are really just, you, it, it's very raw. There, there's the, the, the layer between user and kernel uh, that, that where you hand off your data, it, it's pretty thin. It's, yeah, it, it's four instructions, right? Right. <clears throat> so that's sort of the, uh, sort of the, the dry entry point for, um, uh, for escape. <clears throat> As for render, um, it's a, a similar kind of callback. This one happens basically when, when you want to render something, you go and say render, right? Um, this is the hard rendering. It allows you to motel GPU render uh, from a command buffer. Um, it's sort of a similar concept where this is your callback and this is the um, uh, structure you pass it. Um, and so this the command and this uh, patch location listen, this is stuff that's set up on your behalf when you create a context. Um, and what's interesting about these is that um, both command and uh, patch location list in are mapped in user land, so they're mapped in your address space. So you don't control the pointer where it's mapped. You, that pointer is fixed, but it's in your address space. And that um, is interesting in the sense that um, when the driver has to, has to touch it, because you can, you can still have a, a second thread in user land where you say, oh, I, while it's fixed, I can still unmap this thing, right? And then if, the, if, um, if your kernel equivalent doesn't account for the unmapping, there, well, still bad things can happen. And the other thing is because it's in, in user land, uh, you can also have, even if you account for this unmapping, you can have all these, uh, these race conditions where, because you'll, you'll validate something in that structure. Like you'll validate something in the command buffer, for example, right? Say byte XYZ has to be uh, this value or this value. And then after you validate, you can have a second turn user land that just overwrites it, and all of a sudden your validation is no longer valid. So it's, it's interesting to know that um, while the pointer is fixed, you can still sort of change the content uh, under the, uh, under, underneath the driver without your knowledge. Um, right, so command buffer and patch location go from user land. Um, 
And so actually, it would, what's really interesting is that uh, MSDN says, uh, specifically notes this, right? They say, well, they, they, this comes from, uh, from using a multi driver, uh, and so this way, mini port driver must use try accept code to handle this. Otherwise, you know, if somebody unmaps it, then you, you crash. Um, and uh, WDM actually gives you, uh, MSDN actually gives you, um, t tells you, uh, gives you a uh, sample code for how to do this. And initially, when I looked at it, before I fully understood to create context, I was like, well, if, they're, if they come from user land, um, shouldn't you be probing and capturing your stuff before you do this? Um, and because afterwards, I was like, oh, create context actually maps this stuff on your behalf, so you don't control the pointer, it just happens to be in your address space. Um, and so there, there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, probing that happens here because it doesn't need to be probed, it's already been probed. But you still need to do a try accept. Um, yeah, so user doesn't actually get to do this because, uh, uh, right. Yeah, I pretty much covered this slide, awesome. Um, so I have an example of how to do this, and actually, um, this is uh, this is from a real driver, and this has already been fixed. So this is um, uh, this is from uh, the uh, virtual box driver, um, uh, and so this is this is the, uh, uh, the render callback, and they basically go, well, this is this is your your uh, your private data buffer right here, or your command buffer right here, and then uh, they say they they touch this stuff, but there's no try except. So this can obviously blue screen, right? And this comes from a real driver, so this this is real code that that has done it wrong, hasn't done what MSDN said you should do. Um, uh, so that's one example of, of not having a try accept. That's one example, and so here's another example of uh, the same driver uh, in the same function where uh, not, this isn't just a crash, this is actually, this is sort of a, uh, this is a race condition, right, where you get, you get sort of a, a time of check, time of use condition where um, you know, this pointer comes from the command buffer and then there's this validation that happens here um, and then after this validation, uh, that data gets used. Uh, but because it points to user land, between validation and between use, I can have a second thread and just overwrite the data. And then all the checks that happen here are no longer valid. Um, so, and this is, this is the, the same driver, uh, di different bug. This, this one has been fixed too. Uh, this is, uh, both of them are virtual bugs. And I, I be uh, believe Oracle fixed them in a CPU in April. So it's been, it's been fixed for a while. Um, so I, because their driver's open source, I used it to sort of start off my research and sort of guide me towards what these things look like. Because, you know, it, it's, it's easier to read uh, C or C++ code than it is to look at it and go like, mm, I wonder what this structure does. Um, right, so how do we talk to this thing from user land? Well, it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? There's a, there's a function for it and there's a structure and again, the structure isn't, isn't the same as the kernel structure, but it's very similar, right? So when you go from kernel to user mode, there's, there's sort of this translation between these structures that happen, right? But they, it, it contains the, the same kind of information. Um, and again, it's really just, even though it's a function, it's, if you go to the symbol server, the symbol server says, actually this is just a, a very thin syscall wrapper. Okay, um, so allocation, so this one basically does uh, allocation, uh, on user land's behalf to allocate memory, and this is, it's either system memory or video memory, depending on which flags you set. Um, and so the, the kernel callback basically, um, it's called DG, uh, DXGK DDI create allocation, and this is fairly fair similar stuff to the, the previous three ones I covered, um, where you, um, the second uh, argument is the structure, and this, the structure basically contains a number of things that you as an attacker have very little control over, but it also contains a, a private, uh, uh, a uh, private data pointer and a private data size, which, again, as we know, that's a tax surface. That's completely up to the driver how, to, how they want to implement it and how, how they want to parse it. Um, and the data is completely controlled by user land, right? Um, and then, so there's a second structure in there, which is P allocation info, um, which, and you can have a list of P allocation info numbers, and each one of those will have their own private data size. So you have this, you can have a private data size and then a list of private data sizes, and all of this is a tax surface, and all of it, goes through like one system call. So there's, there's a fair amount of potential tax surface here. Um, uh, so, uh, right, yeah, let's cover this. Okay, so how do you, how do you get this from user land? Same kind of thing, right? It's, it's, it, there's a function for this and there's a structure which, is, which isn't the same as the kernel one, but it looks very similar. Um, and, you know, again, if you look at it in, this, in a disassembler and you go to the symbol server, uh, Microsoft symbol server says, actually, it's really a system call and it's, you know, and it's these four instructions. Okay. So now the fourth one, query adapter. Query adapter is a little bit different because so the previous three I covered all have these um, 
these input buffers where you go into the driver and say, well, parse this, parse this. So those are, I can see your, your entry points, right? The thing I found interesting with entry, with um, query adapter is that it, it's not so much the entry points as it is the exit points. So you go to the driver and you say, hand me this back. And depending on what you, what you tell it, um, some of them have these predefined structures that have to be this big or this big or so forth. But some of them can have these, uh, these blobs, right? And when you get blobs back from kernel, it's so interesting when you start inspecting them to see if you can find like a, a, a member in a structure that wasn't initialized or, or some kind of compiler slack space that was added somewhere or um, you know, bits and bytes or ranges of bytes that, are, that were never written to. Um, and so you get these leaks of, of uninitialized um, kernel memory back. Um, and so I, I've seen a few of these in, in query adapters. Um, and so, yeah, same deal as before, right? There's a function for this and you uh, do, uh, there's, there's a, um, a structure, you pass it. Um, and so there, there, yeah, there's an input buffer and output buffer because, so depending on which query adapter, um, so it, it, there's, a, there's a type you say, and depending on which type, um, it, it'll expect different structures. So some will have input and some will have output. Actually, most have output, uh, but only a handful of input. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, it's interesting uh, entry and exit points. Um, th this is uh, uh, data that, that is being passed in from user land, but more, uh, more importantly, it's the exit points are, are the things that are interesting, where you, well, you get all this data back from drivers. And, you, and just, if you start looking at these things, like every so often you'll see something where if you do the same call five or 10 times over, like there'll be like this range of bytes that like, just randomly seem to contain garbage or, or, or maybe there'll be some structure in one but no structure in the other where you, where you like go like, well, that, that one looks like, it, like it's, uh, like it's uh, an information leak, right? And then you go look at the driver or, or, or and, and, uh, you go look at the, the assembly or code if you have it. And quite often when you have those kind of situations, um, you, you'll, have, uh, uh, you'll have an information leak. Okay, right, so how do you talk from user land? You know, same procedure, right? There's a function for this, and it's a structure which isn't quite the same as the, the kernel structure, but it, they're very closely, closely related. Um, and again, it's, 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 even though uh, MSDN says it's, it's a function, it's not really a function, it's a system call. Um, so yeah, so um, when I start looking at, at, the, at, at some of these drivers, uh, there's a number of things I found that, that and, and I haven't really gotten all that far drives because there's many of them, and, and the lead up of these things sort of took, took a lot of my time. Uh, but when I start lo looking at them, um, there, there are sort of three things I found uh, uh, that were fairly obvious where, um, that, that I, I think, I, and, and these, it's not like these are new, but it's sort of the, yeah, I want to reiterate, be, to make sure that if, if you're ever going to be involved in writing a graphics driver, please keep these things in mind. First of all, out of bound read or write, right? When you take a buffer where you know data comes from, uh, uh, comes from an attacker, right? Every, every bit counts, every byte counts, right? If you, if you take the buffer and you read out the first or the second byte and you haven't validated that the second byte is there, you just assume that's wrong, right? In, in user land, you might get away with it, right? In kernel mode, you don't, right? That, that reading that second byte can be a blue screen, right? Because the first byte could be at the end of a page and the second page couldn't be mapped and all of a sudden you get a blue screen, right? So these things really matter when you write kernel code, right? Um, and and out, of, out of bound writes are usually something where if you're a developer, you go like, well, that's memory corruption. We, we understand it. And so people tend to be very careful with those things. But out of bound reads, people tend not to be very careful with that, um, even though you still end up with a blue screen. Um, so so the, that's very common, and, and I wish people, when they write kernel code, go like, even out of bound reads, you know, you have to be really, really careful. Um, that, that's one. The second one I saw is, and this was through uh, a lot of drivers, surprisingly, is that um, it, it won't be like the debug code, but it'll be, um, uh, like the debug functions themselves will be gone, but all the surrounding context for debug code is still there. So you'll see these uh, creation of strings saying, well, function X, Y, Z does this, and it's supposed to do so and so. Um, even though it will never get printed, the strings are still there. And so uh, if, if you're a reverse engineering driver, that's very, very useful because all of a sudden you're telling me what, what your driver's doing and I don't have to you know, spend uh, a night uh, looking at all this weird assembly. Um, so when, when, you, uh, when you make a driver and you ship them, make sure you delete all the debug code, and not just the actual print call, but the surrounding code as well to make sure that it, you, know, you don't make it easier on people than you have to. Um, and the third one I saw is, I um, can't remember which driver it was, but one of them um, made sort of their own library of all these uh, integer overflow routines, um, which, let's just say that it was there, um, and uh, um, 
rolling your own for these kind of uh, uh, safety routines is generally a bad idea because you know one mistake and, and, and you know it doesn't and your entire safety goes away, right? Whereas um, the Windows kernel has its own integer uh, uh, library routines. I mean, it's sort of a fixed point, right? If, first of all, they're very, very well tested. It's highly unlikely there will be a bug in the uh, uh, Windows integer uh, library routines. And even if there are, it's not your fault. It's Microsoft's, and they'll fix it when if you find one, right? Um, so don't, don't, don't roll your own. Don't use the, uh, don't, don't make your own uh, uh, integer overflow uh, checking functions. Um, use the, the ones that are in kernel. They're available to you. Stuff like RTL, you wouldn't add, and so forth. Um, use those, okay. Um, right, okay, that's the dry stuff, awesome. So um, how do you, so now, writing your full user to, 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 to uh, talk to the kernel, how does that work? Well, it turns out it's slightly more difficult um, th than I thought it was, because while the APIs are documented in SDN, um, the, the actual headers, they're not there. You can't find them, they're, they're not anywhere. Um, and this is mostly meant for, for OpenGL installable client driver stuff, so unless you're writing that, you're not really supposed to be calling these things, even though they're exported. Um, and so there is, there's a dev kit for this, and then MSDN says, well, to obtain license, you know, email this team and so and so. I didn't, I didn't do that because I wanted to get sort of the, the hacker's point of view for this without having that. Um, but because these structures are documented in MSDN, it, you know, Getting like a partially working implementation is really easy because you just you know copy paste from SDN to uh, the editor and it, it works. Um, or if you don't want to use that, you could use the COM APIs, but I'm not a huge fan. Um, anyway, once you have those headers working, it's just a, a case of load library, a get proc address, and you can just start using these things. Okay, so once you have a full program and, and I did all these tests, um, what, you really, what, what I really want to do is write a program where I could hook the APIs and see, because every, every driver is different, right? And so I want to know what the protocol is between UMD and KMD. And the only way to really see that is to sort of start snooping data, see what, what real data looks like. Um, and so I, I wrote a, a small utility to sort of be like, where I hook escape, render, create allocation, and create after info um, for, for, uh, for a driver and then see what, what happens and, and where that happens. Um, and so I will see if I can demo this. Keep your fingers crossed because, you know, demos don't always work. Uh, so uh, the, the best program, or an easy program I found where you can easily snoop data is, um, is uh, the Microsoft PowerPoint Viewer because it's all graphics and every time you do a slide transition, there's all sorts of rendering that has to happen and it, you control the transition, right? Because you get to say when the slide goes. Um, so I used Microsoft PowerPoint Viewer and that, that Thus far has worked pretty well. Um, what I first wanted to do is I wanted to have like a, um, a stock vanilla Windows without any kind of graphics driver that is just the Windows. Uh, and I thought I had one of those in the VM. Of course, I wake up this morning an hour before I have to do the presentation and I can't find the VM. So I, I can't actually show you what a stock Windows looks like when it does these things. Um, but, uh, or I can't show you, but I can tell you. Basically, for every slight transition, if you have a stock Windows without any kind of uh, more advanced graphics driver, um, you'll see for every transition there will be like one call to render, one call to render, one call to render, and that's pretty much it. Um, this is a, 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 an old netbook that I have. Uh, it has an, a, an old AMD cart, um, but you get to see all the magic that happens, uh, like the true magic of, of what these carts do, like the, the stuff that happens behind your back, but that makes things you know, much better than if you just use standard Windows carts. So uh, I picked some random presentation off the internet. I don't know what this is, but... Um, so, and then you uh, hook it, okay, and let's hope this works. You do a slight transition, and this is all, this is all uh, AMD driver magic that happens behind your back, right? And it, 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 this, this looks slow, but it, it's only slow because I'm hooking it, and my tool is really, really slow. Um, but you'll see, so this is all, so you see this, is, this will be an escape, and this, all, these, these, all these bytes here, that's, that's AMD, that's AMD protocol, right? That's, User goes to the driver and says, do this, do this, do this. This isn't described anywhere else. Uh, this is, and, and nothing, there's no spec that's, maybe there's, but there's no public spec that says it has to be this or this or this. Um, and so now once you sniffed it, this data is really important because once I know what these bytes look, look like, I, could, I can try to mimic it and see if I can get any bugs out of it, right? Um, so that, 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 was my, that was my tool. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be released. Um, It'll be released on our website, uh, hopefully today, but I can't guarantee that. But anyway, it'll be released soon. Um, so, right, so now we have all that. Um, how do, putting it all together, right? So fuzzing. 
So once we have this nooping tool, creating a mutating fuzzer is relatively easy, right? You take, oh crap, hold on. There we go. Right, so I did this, I did this. So yeah, putting it all together, uh, fuzzing and reverse engineering. <clears throat> so once we have this, uh, this snooping tool, you just take the data I just showed you and you can sort of write a tool around it and it says, well, the, you take that as your template, right? The valid bytes, you, you, you saw what sniffer, right? You know that's valid because that was AMD client talk, AMD user land talk, AMD kernel, and it, it succeeded, so you know that's a valid. And you, so you try to uh, take that and then mutate it and see if something happens or if nothing happens. Um, and, and so um, I, I, I build a small fuzz around that that, that, um, that does that. Um, and so you basically do that in a loop uh, and, and, and until hopefully something crashes. And if, if it doesn't, you, you can, if it doesn't, I'll, I'll get back to that in, in the next few slides. Um, but I also have a small demo of that and I hope it'll work. But, okay. Okay, let's see if this one works. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So that, so that uh, if you just start mutating this stuff, these things crash. Um, <laughs> and so I did, um, I did, I did report this to the AMD guys, um, and they, they have fixed it, and I was told that there's gonna be an update somewhere in August this month. You, you probably might know more about this. Um, Right, so the problems in this AMD driver, the problems that I found with this fuzzer, been reported AMD and they fixed them and the, I think the patch are coming out somewhere this month. Yeah, so they're coming out a few days, few weeks. Um, so this stuff's gonna get fixed soon. Um, so this is how, how, how easy it can be to fuzz this stuff, right? So you basically do this in a loop and then, um, you know, bugs come out. So sometimes reverse engineering will be needed because you wanna see, you know, what the bug looks like, what it is, how it works, right? Um, and so, um, there's actually this, there's this book about version that came out a few months ago, uh, and my buddy Bruce Dang wrote it, and he had this interesting quote which I just had to put in here. Oh, God damn it! Yeah, there we go. So uh, that says, uh, if the process of versioning Windows drivers could be modeled as a discrete task, 90% is understanding how the thing works, and only 10% is understanding assembly. That is all the build up until this has been there because. Otherwise, you can read all the assembly you want. You don't know what it means, right? Now that we know what, this, what the, the callback looks like and we know what the arguments look like, reverse engineering stuff is, is trivial, right? It becomes really easy. Um, so I showed before, right? You do this DXG k initialize and um, you pass the callback. And this stuff is actually a little bit tricky when you look at it the first time in a dissembler because uh, DXJ k initialize um, is an inline function, which means you don't go out and call it. Um, there's no, there's, there's no symbol for this, it's just, it's assembly that gets sort of mapped into your image, right? Um, <clears throat> and so, um, you basically, this, I did, this is a, I made, I made a debug driver, so that's because you get to see the symbol, because it comes with a PDB file. But usually you just see a call to, you know, a, an address. Um, so what does it look like? <clears throat> well, you get this call to this function, and then this function basically, um, you'll do this, you'll see this, okay. So basically what happens is, how, how, how does this callback really work? Well, it, goes and loads the DX uh, kernel. Um, it, it's usually already there, but in case it's not, it gets loaded. And once that thing is loaded, you get a, a, a pointer to the device object, and you do a, a, an IOCL on that device object, video, a video device function 10, method neither, on the access. I don't know exactly what that does, but that's what, that's what this function does. So, and then it hands you back a function pointer, and you call that function pointer with, um, um, with the method you, you, you register, right? Um, and I'm saying this because uh, because the stuff's inlined, and so you won't see that call. You'll just see these these set of instructions that do this. So when you see this or these set of things, um, that's when you know a, a callback gets re the, a set of callbacks get registered. Um, the uh, table itself um, is interesting because th that's where you find the callback, right? That, that's where all your entry points are. So you want to find that thing, right? Um, it's it's it can be created or stored in different ways, and it's usually pretty trivial to find these things. Um, it, it'll be, you know, they'll be filled out on stack where they'll have some dedicated function to fill out a, a global array of these things. They're usually pretty easy to find. Like, it'll look something like this, where, uh, like, this will be a dedicated function that just, you know, writes a bunch of callbacks to a, to a global structure, or this is something that writes to, this, to the stack, and then that pointer to that array gets handed back to the kernel. <clears throat> um, and the actual structure looks like this, right? It's basically just a structure of all these callbacks. And 
some of which are, um, there'll, there'll, be, uh, uh, there'll be escape and, and render and query uh, adapter and so forth. And so mapping, these, ma mapping this structure back to the IDA stuff is pretty easy, and I started doing it here. But this, this stuff is, is really is pretty easy. Um, so once you get uh, to the stuff where you get the private data handling, right, this is where it gets interesting, and this is sort of where, um, once you see that in a disassembler, it, it feels very much like you're um, looking at, at a network protocol handler, where it, you get a pointer and a length, and it does, it, it'll have like a, uh, um, uh, it'll generally have like a header with like a type length value, and then it'll, based on whatever the type is, it'll, it'll call back into all these things, and you'll see like a switch case, right? This is, this is one driver. I can't remember which one it is. But it's, 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 it's pretty much where, um, you know, they'll go, well, this is the, the callback, and then this is the type, and then for every type, there's basically not a function that gets called, right? So this is, this is pretty standard stuff. Like, once you get here, like, you, you can, you also, you kind of start smelling the bugs. You're like, mm, you know, where's the good stuff, right? Um, so that this is, when you start seeing these things that you get, I tend to get a little bit excited. Um, but <clears throat> this, the, the, once you get there, it's, that's, that's where the good stuff happens, right? Um, so when you start doing, combining this with runtime testing, um, one of, so one of the things you, you want to look at is sort of, the, the return values basically gives you, says you, uh, tells you either failure or success. Um, and then, uh, uh, failure, uh, success is usually zero, and success will be any number of empty status codes. Usually the one you see the most when something wrong happened is a uh, status invalid parameter, which is 0xc, a bunch of zeros d. Um, and when, when you do, like when you fuzz the stuff in a loop, and you see everything comes back with just um, status invalid parameter without anything else, that usually means that the driver has some kind of very early on length checking. Um, and um, I've seen, some of them have it, some of them don't. Um, I think this one came from the Intel driver. Um, and so basically this is, this function got called direct, like immediately after uh, the DXG uh, callback. Um, and, uh, and basically, um, you, you see basically that they say, well, driver size has to be at least uh, this length, and, and the length has to match exactly with, I'm, I'm almost done. <coughs> the length has to match exactly with this embedded length field, right? And once you see that piece of code, you, you can be like, oh, well now, if, if I just implement this logic in my fuzzer, you get past all this stuff, and all of a sudden you run the fuzzer, and there's like immediate blue screens, right? Um, so, this, so if, if you see this behavior where just everything stands develop parameter, just go look for that early uh, bound check somewhere, because once you get past that, you know the fuzzer starts finding stuff again. Um, so yeah, as a summary, so pretty much almost done. Yeah, uh, WDM has been around since Vista. It, it's evolved over time. There are several interesting trust boundaries and entry points: uh, escape, render, allocation, query adapter. Uh, there might be a few others, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, like uh, in uh, WDM for Windows 8.1, they had, there was support added for uh, Miracast, which is this remote display protocol, which may have interesting uh, attack servers, but I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, most of the attack server control uh, data sent from Unity community is not standardized anyway. Driver gets implemented any way they want, which is interesting because you know, that's your attack surface, right? So there, it's, it's not structured like, like WDM drivers. There's no warps, there's no ioctals, there's none of that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what the last one. Okay, so <clears throat> as a conclusion, uh, this has been pretty much untouched attack service up until now. I started looking at this stuff, and you, you make this fuzzer, and uh, most of the drivers you try it against, they, they, they'll all fall at some point. Um, I, so it, it's interesting to see that, that it's untouched attack service, and, and so there's work to be done here. But I, I think it's going to get better. So I reported to, to the AMD guys, for example, and then they fixed a bunch of these things. Um, and I reported to some others, and they're working on patches too. Um, so I'm, I think it's going to get better. Um, but at the present time, it's not great. Um, and so there's some work to be done. But it'll, it'll get better, I think. Anyway, that's it. Um, anybody have any questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. So, so your question is whether what I think about the design of WDM in terms of entry point and then attack surface. Okay, uh, there, there's some things I liked. There's some things I didn't. Um, whenever you have like probing capturing, I think that's good because it takes away a lot of the attack surface. Um, 
I think uh, things would be, you'd have less attack surface or, or things that are easy, more easily checked or controlled when you have a more structured way of passing data. Of course, the downside of that is that um, you as the driver developer lose some control, right? Um, so it's this double-edged sword. Um, the other one is, of course, um, it, it, you know, stuff like when, when you do a render and, and you get all these user land uh, pointers, there's a lot of extra checking that needs to happen. And obviously, you could optimize that and do probing and capturing, but then you lose performance, right? So it, you get this weird trade-off. So I, I think overall, it's, I think it's good. There's very few things where I go like, you know, this one's really bad. Um, but you, you can see where the, the guys who designed stuff at Microsoft sat down and said, well, this is a trade-off, right? We could do this better for security, but it would cost us, right? And if you're talking about graphics, you know, you want performance, right? You want that stuff, right? So some trade-offs have to be made. I, I think it's pretty good. I, from a security point of view, I, I like it. Yeah, there's things that could be better, but uh, the previous model was a lot worse. So I think it's pretty good. Okay, did I answer the question? Awesome. Any other questions? Over here? Oh, yeah. Am I going to read the fuzzer? Ah, uh, that's a good question. So I haven't made up my mind yet. Um, I, I'm planning to at some point, maybe. Um, it'll, I think if I do it right now, it'll piss off a number of people. Um, I want to release it, trust me. It's a question I've asked myself uh, uh, for a while. Um, and hopefully at some point. Uh, but I can't say that right now. Any other questions? Awesome. Yes, I'm done. Uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>